Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're looking at a scholarly article today from a um, website, a Christian think tank, and they allow you to use the material. And um, so we're looking at christianthinktank.com dash messiah dot html. Uh, it's the the article is Messianic Expectations in the First Century Judaism and its documentation from non-Christian sources. Uh, the guy who runs the website uh, does very in-depth scholarly work uh, on the subjects that he does. I'm going to be reading some of the article and then pausing and giving you my own thoughts on what the guy has said. But it's a very scholarly article and uh, will uh, enrich your uh, thinking about first century Judaism and I uh, hope that it's a blessing to you. Um, I'm allowing comments on for tonight but um, when the video comes fully up uh, on the channel I uh, will be closing comments because um, I'm getting uh, atheists to come and spoil my um, videos by the comments that they're making. Uh, so that's where we'll be going and um, tonight. So I hope that you um, enjoy this uh, article. Um, so let's begin. Uh, a young person or somebody writes to the guy who runs the Christian think tank. I'm a Christian freshman. I really enjoy your homepage and I've printed out a lot to share with friends. One difficulty there that I'm encountering and that I wish you would spend more time on is the question whether Jesus was a failure as the Messiah, the Messiah of the Old Testament. I have several friends with whom I have taken up the discussion and showed them your answer to the question. However, one girl said that it was untrue that many Jews of Jesus' day saw him as the Messiah. She maintains that the Jews of the day were really not expecting a Messiah, that we Christians in retrospect have interpreted much of the Old Testament as containing prophecies of a Messiah. She even says that the Gospel writers went back and created stories to fulfill prophecy, such as when Jesus tells the people that the scroll of Isaiah yeah, as I was being fulfilled in, in him. She has a deep sympathy with the Jews and seems to think that someone came in and falsely interpreted the Hebrew Bible as having prophecies of Messiah and then attributing them to these to Jesus. I would really appreciate it if you would go into more depth on the topic from the perspective of first century Jew. So this article is not my article. It's from a guy of Christian think tank. He gives permission to use his material, and it's uh, on messianic expectations in first century Judaism. I'm going to be reading the material, and where my own expertise is, where I've read stuff, I'll put my own chip in, but I'll let you know that these are my own thoughts. Um, so I would encourage you to go and read the article. Just type in uh, Christian think tank messianic expectation in first century Judaism and you'll be able to get uh, the information there. Apart from the... Now he writes, apart from the seriously mistaken notion that all of Jesus' contemporaries were a Pharisee background, that is, end of quote, that's from the Christian think tank. Absolutely, um, goes without saying. Which seems to be based on James and critical use of fringe writer Makaboy. This rather an exciting description of the Messianic hope is so out of touch with biblical scholarship of today as to be worthless. What this nets out to, to is the popular notion that either the first century Jew had no expectation of Messiah figure 
of the first century Jewish expectation was a purely natural, human-only regular political re leader. Both of these positions are completely mistaken in the light of the hard data we have. What I intend to do to this piece is to demonstrate from the Jewish non-Christian sources that not only was there a messiahic expectation, but that it varied from group to group. That is, that some consider the messiah to be purely nat natural in history, a political leader, albeit more powerful than the Romans. Some consider the messiah to be supernatural, superangelic. Some consider him to be a after history, universal king, son of God, and some did not expect one at all. And to try to minimize attempted rebuttal, I'll try to quote the non-Christian source for the reader's inspection, being sure to avoid passages that are considered to be Christian interpolation. I insertions into the text. I do not intend to be exhaustive in this. Uh, due to the nature, I'm, I'm just jumping some of the things he's saying, just so we get to the more meaty bits. Due to the nature of some of these documents, not all of which have been translated into English, some of the citations I will not be able to provide in the text. The major source works I am using are the NWNTI, GTM, BPM, DSST, SSTM, LTJM, CTM, etc. You can go look at the citations. One methodological issue that needs to be brought up here concerns how we will identify messianic passages. If a text describes a future superhuman ruler without ascribing Davidic status to him, will that disqualify the passage? Some actually approach it this way, but the image complex of the messi messianic figure is far too big to be narrowly approached. Um, one writer, it is inappropriate to speak of a Jewish expectation of the Messiah at this point because few of the extant late prophecies that shape Jewish hopes even use the term anointed. Focus on the new David or descendant of David, moreover, was by no means the only image of Jewish hopes for a revived eschatological kingship. Some of the scriptural texts most important to the hopes of later generations of Judeans contain no explicit language of anointed or branch, shoot horn son of David. There was rather, for example, a focus on the scepter, a star, in Genesis 14, 9, 10, Numbers 24, 17. See also Evans in NWNTI 239. Although Messiah, i.e. anointed one from Hebrew, Massa, Greek, Cherin, is often understood in terms of the royal son of David, in reality, messianic concepts in late antiquity are quite diverse. If we understand Messiah to mean one who believes himself to be anointed by God in order to play a leading role in the restoration of Israel, a restoration which may or may not involve the Davidic monarchy, then it is correct to speak of anointed kings, anointed prophets and anointed priests. All these are categories rooted in biblical and historical precedents." End of quote. So our research, says the think tank, will consider passages interpreted messianically in this sense. Not look for a rigid linguistic form, but rather for an eschatological, eschatological hope of Israel <coughs> that God would visit his people with salvation. Somehow, I will not exclude from consideration simple uh, acolyptic passages, i.e. dealing with the end time future events, if there is no debt to the ring concerning messianic individual. One final practical matter. I will create online citations first and then go and type in the textual data. In some cases, I have to visit the library, ESP, for some of the rabbinical quotes. Uh, so he goes into the sources, the Septuagint translation, the Jewish Apocrypha, the Jewish pseudo uh, Pigrypha, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Philo of Josephus, the Tigrums. Uh, early Teniac rabbinical writings, historical data. In fact, we'll just go through these sources. Septuagint is the translation of the Old Testament in Greek. The Jewish Apocrypha is 15 books, was written in the 1st and 2nd century BC, and as such gives visibility into the thoughts of the 20, of the 1st century Judaism. Jewish pseudo epigrapher many of these writings predate or are contemporaneous with the New Testament. Dead Sea Scrolls, writings, either predate the New Testament or are contemporaneous with it. The works of Philo, Jesus, 
John Josephus, both are either pre-New Testament or Sinal New Testament. They will give us some data. The Targums, these are Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Old Testament, Hebrew Bible, early uh, Tenaic, rabbinical writings, and historical data on Messianic claimants. So, <clears throat> the Septuagint translation, Hebrews 49.10. Uh, Hebrew, the scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedient of the nations is his. A ruler shall not fail from Judah or a prince from his lions until there come the things stored up for him, and he is the expectation of the nations. Numbers 24 7. Water will flow from their buckets, their seed will have abundant water, their king will be greater than Agag, their kingdom will be exalted with the, there shall come a man out of his seed and he shall rule over many nations and the kingdom of God shall be exalted and his kingdom shall be increased Numbers 24 17 I see him but not now I behold him but not near a star will come out of Jacob a scepter will rise out of Israel he will crush the foreheads of Moab the schools of all the sons of Seth I will point to him but not now I, I bless him but he draws not near, a star shall rise out of Jacob, a man shall bring out of Israel, and shall crush the princes of Moab, and shall spoil all the sons of, Me of Seth. Psalm 72, 5, 7, he will endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all the generations in his days, the righteous will flourish, prosperity will abound, abound till the moon is no more, and he shall continue as long as the sun, and before the moon forever. In his day shall righteousness bring up an abundance of peace till the moon be removed. Psalm 110.3 Your troops will be willing on the day, uh, on your day of battle, arrayed in holy majesty from the womb of the dawn, you will receive the dew of your mouth. Uh, with these, thee in dominion in the day of thy power, in the splendors of thy saints, I have begotten thee from the womb before the morning star. Hebrews 9 6 for to us a child is born to us a son is given the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace for a child is born to us and a son is given to us whose government is upon his shoulders and his name shall be called messenger angel of the great council Mm -hmm. So that's in the uh, Septuagint, and um, so obviously there is a Messiah um, that that shows you what in the Old Testament it teaches a little bit. There's a there's tons more information, but you just get a little snippet of there is a Messiah coming. Now we're looking at the Jewish Apocrypha. In Second Edras chapter seven verse twenty six to thirty, he said, "For indeed the time will come when the signs that I have foretold to you will come to pass, that the city that now is not seen shall appear, and the land that now is hidden shall be disclosed. Everyone who has been delivered from the evils that I have foretold shall see my wonders. For my son the Messiah shall be revealed with those who are with him." And those who remain shall rejoice four hundred years. After those years, my son, the Messiah, shall die. And all who draw him draw human breath. And the, ter the, the world shall be turned by primal silence for seven days, as it was the first beginnings, so that no one shall be left. Second Ezra, uh, uh, as E S D R, chapter twelve, verse thirty-one, thirty-four. As for the lion whom you saw rousing up out of the forest and roaring and speaking up to the eagle and proving him for unrighteousness. And for all his words that you have heard, this is the Messiah whom the Most High has kept until the end of days. He will arise from the offspring of David and will come back and speak with him. He will denounce them from the ungodliness and for the wickedness and will display before them their contemporaneous, contentious dealings. But first he will bring them alive before his judgment seat, and when he has reproved them, he will destroy them. But in mercy he will set free the remnant of my people who have been saved. Second ESDR, chapter 
14 verse 3, the vision. As I kept looking, the wind made something like the figure of a man come up out of the heart of the sea. And I saw that this man flew with the clouds of heaven. This is the interpretation of the vision. As for your seeing a man come from the heart of the sea, this is whom the Most High has been keeping for many ages. He will himself deliver his creation. When these things take place, the signs occur that I showed you before. Then my son will be revealed, whom you saw as a man coming up from the sea. Second address 13, 36, 37. But he shall stand on the top of Mount Zion. Zion shall come and be made manifest to all people, prepared and built as you saw the mountain carved out with the hands. Then he, my son, will reprove the assembled nations for their ungodliness. Second Edris, second ASDR, chapter 13, 52. Then he said to me, Just as no one can explore or know what is the depths of the sea, so one can see my son or those who are with him except in the time of his day. Second Esther's four nine for you shall take it up from humankind and as for you shall live with my son with whom I like you until the times are ended. So there's generally a belief in the son as the Messiah, a representative of a new age. I find that very interesting. These are my own thoughts. First Maccabees is generally considered the least messianic, maybe even anti-messianic of the Old Testament. Apoc still has mild statements on Maccabees 4.46. And stored the stones, sacred altar stones, in a convenient place on the temple hill until a prophet should come to tell what to do with them. On Maccabees 9.27, so there was a great distress in Israel, such as not been since the, the time that prophets to appear among them. On Maccabees 4, 14, 14, 41, the Jews and their priests have resolved that Simon should be the leader and high priest forever until the trustworthy prophet should arise. Nor the author of 1 Maccabees is familiar with Daniel 7 and also, also narrates some ap uh, apocalyptic scenes such as the resurrection. But the Davidic line is not mentioned in connection with these events seems odd given the others writing in the period make it clear that the connection was commonly held. It is to be remembered, as Goldstein points out, that the author of 1 Maccabees was a pro-Hasmonean protagonist who at least hints that the dynasty of Davis was not forever, but only until the time of Maccabees. Excuse me. So the Jewish pseudo uh, epigrapher, 1, 1 Enoch 46 verse 1, All that place I saw, the one to whom belongs the time before time, and his head was white like wool, and there was with him another individual whose face was like that of a human being. His countenance was full of grace like that of among the holy angels. Who is this? And he answered me and said, This is the Son of Man, to whom belongs righteousness, with whom righteousness dwells. This son of man whom you have seen is the one who would remove the kings of the mighty ones from their comfortable seats and the strong ones from their homes. 1 Enoch 48, 2-10 At that hour the son of man was given a name in the presence of the Lord of Spirits before time, even before the creation of the sun and the moon, before the creation of the stars, he was given a name in the presence of the Lord of the Spirits. He will become a staff for the righteous one in order that they may lean on him and not fall. He is the light of the Gentiles and he will become the hope of those who are sick in their hearts. All those who dwell upon the earth shall fall and worship before him. They shall glorify, bless and sing the name of the Lord of the Spirits. For this purpose he became the chosen one. He was concealed in the presence of the Lord of the Spirits prior to the creation of the world and for eternity and is revealed the wisdom of the word of the Lord of the Spirits, the righteous and holy ones. And uh, for they, the wicked kings and landowners, have divided the Lord of the Spirits and his Messiah. 1 Enoch 51 3, the elect one will sit on God's throne. 1 Enoch 52 4, he said to me, All these things which you have seen happen by the authority of the Messiah, so that he may give an orders to be praised upon the earth. 1 Enoch 62 5, and pain shall seize them when they see the Son of Man sitting on the throne of his glory. 1 Enoch 
Enoch 62.7, Son of man was concealed from the beginning, and the Most High One preserved him in the presence of his power, then he revealed him to the holy and elect ones. 1 Enoch 62.14, The Lord of Spirits will abide for them, they shall eat and rest, arise with the Son of Man forever. 1 Enoch 69.29, Henceforth, nothing that is corruptible shall be found, that the Son of Man has appeared and has seated himself upon the throne of his glory, and all evil shall disappear from before his face. He shall go and tell that the Son of Man, and he shall be strong before the Lord of the Spirits. 1 Enoch 7, 1, 71. And it happened after this that his living name was raised up before that Son of Man unto the Lord among whom dwells upon the earth. 1 Enoch 105. Until the Lord of and my Son are united with them forever in the right paths in their lifetime. Excuse me. Not from the introduction of one Enoch, the Messiah in one Enoch called the righteous one and the Son of Man is depicted as a pre depicted as a pre-existent heavenly being who is resplendent with majesty, possessed all dominion, and sits on his throne of glory, passing judgment upon mortal and spiritual be beings. A human political leader? Question mark. Okay. Um, the Sibline Oracle 3.285 Then the heavenly God will send a king and will judge each man in blood and gleam of fire. There is a certain royal tribe whose race will never stumble. This too as time pursue its psychical course will reign and it will begin to raise up a new temple of God. Sibline Oracle 3.65 Five two to six five five, and then will send a king for the sun. He will stop the entire earth from evil war, killing some, imposing oaths of loyalty on others, and he will not do all these things by his private plan, but in obedience to the whole noble, noble teaching of the great God. Sibylline Oracles five one o eight. Then a certain king sent from God again. Him will destroy all the great kings and noble men. Thus there will be judgment on men by imperishable one. Uh, for a blessed man came from the expanse of heaven with a scepter in his hands which God gave him and he gained away over all things well and gave back the wealth to all the good which previous men had taken he destroyed every city from its foundations and with much fire and burned nations of mortals who were formerly evil doers Psalms of Solomon uh, in 17 chapter 17 21 and 18 9. Uh, chapter 17, 18, draw a quiet detailed portrait of a coming divinic messiah. Since the entire text is almost 60 verses long, I cannot pre-produce it here. It says, See the Lord, and raised up for the king, the son of David, to rule over your servant. And he will be a righteous king over them, taught by God. There will be no unrighteousness among them in his day, for all shall be holy, and the king shall be the Lord messiah. And he will not weaken his days, Reply upon his God, for God made him powerful in the Holy Spirit, and wise in the counsel, understanding with strength and righteousness. This is the beauty of the King of Israel, which God knew to raise him over the house of Israel to discipline. May God cleanse Israel for the day of mercy and blessing for the appointed day when his Messiah will reign. Blessed are those born in those days to see the good things of the Lord, which he will do for the coming generation, which will be understood under the rod of the discipline of the Lord. Messiah. Second Baruch, Syriac uh, Apocalypse of Baruch 29.3 and it will happen that when all which should come to pass in these parts have been accomplished the anointed one will begin to be revealed. Two Baruch, Syriac Apocalypse of Baruch 30 verse 1 and it will happen after these things when the time of the appearance of the anointed one has been fulfilled and he returns with glory that, that then all who sleep in hope of him will rise. 2 Baruch, Syriac, Apocalypse of Baruch 3, 9, verse 7, and it will happen when the time of its fulfillment is approaching in which it will fall, that at the time the dominion of my anointed one, which is like the fountain and the vine, will be revealed. 2 Baruch, Syriac, ap ap uh, Apocalypse of Baruch 40, verse 1, and they will carry him, the last wicked king on Mount Zion, and my anointed one will convict him of 
war is wicked deeds etc and we could go into many we'll go into the Dead Sea Scrolls Aramaic Apocalypse he will be called the Son of God and they will call him the Son of the Most High his kingdom will be an eternal kingdom the earth will be the truth and all will make peace the sword will cease in the earth and all the cities will pay him homage he's a great God among the gods his kingdom will be an eternal kingdom Damascus document those who walk in them in the time of wickedness until there arise the Messiah of Aaron the unique teacher until the arise Messiah of Aaron as well uh, Philo's work uh, Philo says in the life of Moses there shall come forth from you one day a man he shall rule over many nations and the kingdom spreading every day shall be exalted uh, quote to Philo uh, the special theological of the Jewish nation is central both on the historical and the cosmic universal level as well as within the context of futuristic eschatology the expectation of a messianic emperor is not a central but it forms a natural and integral part of the thinking of Philo since he emphasizes the role of Moses as king and entertains an ideology of kingship as part of the Jewish legislation according to the concept of a future messianic emperor is not an alien element in his exegesis and his expectations for the future uh, Josephus Josephus gives us much historical detail about self-proclaimed and popularly embraced messiahs of the period as such these would only document the popular belief in messianic not necessarily his own but this will suffice for my point here that there were significant if ill-formed expectations of heaven sent deliverance by the one anointed and inspired by the task I will sit, cite two texts from Josephus that show both the claimants use of an appeal to being inspired and anointed selected by God for the task as well as a more legitimate understanding of sovereignly appointed leadership Jewish War chapter 2 verse uh, 258 to 60 beside these says Josephus there arose another body of villains with purer hands but more impious intentions who no less than the assassins ruined the peace of the city deceivers and impostors under the pretense of divine inspiration fostering revolutionary change they pursued the multitude to act like madmen and led them out into the desert under the belief that God would give them tokens of deliverance Jewish War chapter 6 3 12 to 13 what more than all else incited them to war was an ambiguous oracle likewise found in the sacred scripture to the effect that at the time of one from their country come rule of the world this they understood to mean someone of their own race many of their wise men went astray in their interpretation of it the oracle however in reality signified the sovereignty of Vespian who was proclaimed emperor on Jewish soil quote notice in the above quote that J held to Josephus held to the belief of a prophesied excuse me, of a prophesied emperor but differed on the identification of the figure that the phrase many of the wise men probably indicates that the messianic expectation was a widespread and b not confined to the less educated people uh, the Targums, the word Messiah occurs in the following places with the exception of Ezekiel passages so he goes into a lot of references there um, 77 references of the Messiah in the Old Testament from these rabbinic, rabbinic sayings notice these 60 plus passages mention the word Messiah there are others that refer to messianic images hopes Levi summarized the portrait of the Messiah in the Targums. The Messiah will be the symbol or the active agent or deliverance of Israel. He will be of divinic lineage, though he may have a son, non divinic predecessor. The Ephraimite Messiah who will die in battle. Elijah will herald his coming and will serve as his high priest. A world conflict will rage between Rome, variously identified as Gog, Amalek, Edom, and Armless on the one hand, and Assyria, Ebena on the other indicating that the Targumist Assyrian and non-Babylonian was the real enemy of Israel and this result in the annihilation both at the time of the messianic event and the enemies of Israel will be shattered either by divine 
messianic intervention. The Messiah will bring an end to the wandering of Israel and the Jewish people will be gathered in from their dispersion to their own land. The northern kingdoms will be reunited with Judah. The drama of the exodus from Egypt will be reenacted in this drama. Moses may participate, made possible by resurrection of the dead. The Messiah will live eternally. He will restore the temple, rebuild Jerusalem, which will enjoy divine protection for itself and its inhabitants. He will have sovereignty. He will have sovereignty over all the world. Make the Torah the universal law of mankind, with the ideal of education being realized to the full. The Messiah will have the gift of prophecy and may have intercessory power to seek forgiveness of sin, but he will punish the un unrepenting wicked of his people as well as of the nation and have the power to cast them into Gehenna. There will be a moral regeneration of Israel and mankind, and the Messiah. Will there will be a righteous justice, justice and equity. Uh, the champion of the poor oppressed, the personification of social justice. He will reward the righteous who will surround him and eternally enjoy the divine effulgence. The essence of the Messiah will be faith in God and he will vindicate that faith and the faithfulness of Israel in the eyes of the world. Well, uh, you've stuck it out so far, so there's still a bit more to go and we're going to come to the conclusion of this now. So, um, the soldier. So I'm getting abuse uh, from atheists rather than actually just leave me alone. Um, they just uh, just not letting me get on with the scholarship that I want to get on with. Um, That's the article there uh, that you can look at, which is uh, there's no copyright. They allow you to use the material. Um, so I just wish you'd go away as atheist. I, I don't I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to engage you. Uh, you're just abusive. You won't let me do my scholarship, and I just want you to leave me alone, to be honest. So I just wish you'd go away. Um, I'm not going to be in touch with you, I'm not going to acknowledge you exist. Uh, if you want to be abusive, then just go and do it to someone else. Okay. Um, anyhow, the article goes on and he looks at loads of Absolutely loads of um, absolute loads of other messianic text, etc. And these are his conclusions, and we'll see what he has to say. So here, here's the here's here's the rub of it all. This is the cash value. So you've been patient, you've waited, and um, we'll get to the value um, of the whole thing okay summary statement of got scholars John Collins messianism in the Maccabee period the notion of a transcendent savior figure under God is perhaps the most significant development in Jewish messianism broadly defined in the second century BC. I find that quite interesting. I think personally that comes from Daniel. The book of Daniel there's quite clearly a transcendent 
Messiah there. He writes that there are some traces of Messianism in the Macca Maccabean period on 64 BC, 30, 63 BC. <coughs> it is, however, that Messianism was neither widespread nor prominent during this period and that there was no one orthodox notion of the Messiah. The traditions to which divinic messiahship was based were preserved, but these in themselves did not ensure any lively expectation. The presence or absence of messianism was primarily determined by the political attitudes and circumstances of the different groups within Judaism. Those who placed their hopes in the institutions and leaders of their day, whether the high priest, uh, Ptolemies or the Maccabees, had little interest in messianism. Uh, apocalyptic groups developed the idea of transcendent saviour figure either as an alternative or as a complement to earthly messianism. Only with the rise of the crew magnitude would find a group with a stronger developed interest in messianism. And then again in the first century BC in the Psalms of Solomon. I'm not too sure that I agree with that because in Josephus uh, there's quite a lot of information there of many different false messiahs. So there's obviously a, a strong messianic expectation. Charles Worth says, We have numerous early Jewish sources that portray the Messiah variously as one who will serve as the eschatological high priest, the Dead Sea Scrolls, or as the consummate benevolent and all-powerful king. Numerous functions are sometimes attributed to the Messiah. He would judge the wicked, destroy them, etc. The late Jewish scholar B. M. Boxer, uh, messianis, uh, messianism, uh, the Exodus pattern, and early rab rabbinical Judaism. Jews in the first two centuries held diverse views regarding the traditional hopes of the future. Rabbinical circles, although apparently not preoccupied with the problem, did discuss the relationship of past redemptions to the future, and masters differed over the place of the prophetically envisioned later days or messianic periods. In this, within the scheme of the future. I'll read that again. Jews in the first two centuries held diverse views regarding the traditional hopes for the future. Rabbinical circles, although apparently not preoccupied with the problem, did discuss the relationship of past redemptions to the future ones. And masters differed over the place of the prophetically envisioned later days or messianic period within the scheme of the future. And seeing how these early rabbinical circles differentiated between the aspects of traditional messianic belief, we can appreciate how they responded in a positive, creative fashion to, to the inherent views of the future. Hoyle and Hansen, expectation anointed royal figure, began to revive somewhat during the Hasmonean period. The fact that a resurgence had begun is evident in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as noted at the beginning of his chapter, the occurrence of the term Messiah or Son of David is still rare in Jewish literature, and prior to and contemporary with the rise of actual popular messianic movements. The very occurrence of the later is evidence enough of the revival of the tradition of popular kingship. Next, even the Jewish scholar Jacob Nauser, who attempts to minimize traditional notions of the Messiah, readily admits that the messianic expectations of pre-messianic Jewish uh, Jewry were those of an exaltus, exalted superhuman figure. Nauser believes that the compiler of the Mishnah were attempted to resolve the same issues but in a different way. In describing this attempt, Nauser gives a telling description of what the older traditions were in Mishnah and Messiah. We focus upon how the sin laid out in the Mishnah takes up and disposes of those critical issues of theology worked out through Messianic eschatology in other earlier versions of Judaism, emphasis mine. These earlier systems resorted to the myth of the Messiah as Saviour and Redeemer of Israel, a supernatural figure engaged in political and historical tasks as the King of Jews, even a God-man emphasized mine, facing the crucial historical questions of Israel, of Israel life and resolving them, the Christ as King of the world the ages of the death itself. John Collins, the expectation of the king from the Davidic line, which is dormant from much of the post-exilic era, resurfaces after the restoration native non-Davidic Jewish kingship of the Hasmonean period, late 2nd to early 1st century BCE. It then reappears in more than setting by the 1st century CE. It can fairly be said to be part of the common heritage of Judaism. 
Uh, what's my conclusion? Um, my conclusion is I think the best place to go when you're trying to understand messianic expectations um, is Josephus really because he gives you um, a general picture of the different ways of thinking um, I think it's quite complex really to work out uh, what Judaism believed in the first century um, because there were so many different sources um, like the Enoch and all the various other texts um, well, it's clear when you read Josephus, uh, it's very, very clear there was a kind of expectation of various messiahs, various ideas. I think people couldn't work out what um, what the actual scripture was actually saying, because like when when um, Jesus came, they asked him, "Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet?" they understood that there might have been three people coming or even four people coming in some text um, the Jews of the day wondered whether Jesus was one of the major four that was coming so it's obviously there were lots of different ideas floating about in the first century about who the Messiah would be um, the interesting question is did Jesus take purely from the scripture or did he take from these other writings but these other writings came after the Old Testament so they would have been influenced by the Old Testament so they would have had different strands of the Old Testament within their statements what's the conclusion the conclusion, um, I think number one, be very wary when atheist or skeptic start quoting ish, uh, text in, in ancient times about who Jesus is and what, what the ancient said. It's good to just go and check all the references yourself. You find on this particular topic there are hundreds of references of the Messiah in many different pieces of literature from Josephus to Philo and other stuff so check it all yourself um, secondly um, Christ as a Messiah stands out because he he's the one that gathered a community of disciples around him train them for three years and then tells that he's going to die on a cross and then he dies and then he tell, he's, he's resurrected and tells his people to go and preach the gospel now here's the point could it be let's for sake of argument could it be that Jesus was not the son of God that he was not truly divine and what happened was in the time of Jesus this Jewish man very religious sincere devout man very godly man he was a kind of prophet grew up with this real sense that he was the savior of the world and drew on these pre first century texts Maccabees and other texts, whatever other texts were, first Enoch or whatever, and began to see himself as the restorer of Israel. And delude, was deluded into thinking that he was the Messiah. And was willing to to do whatever it took to redeem Israel. However, he died and 
that was the end of it his ministry had failed but then his disciples then had these visions and they had these they wanted to exalt this amazing person they had met and in the delusion but in the sincere delusion they wrote gospels and literature to say that Jesus rose again from a human point of view it seems that that is a possibility um, it is a possibility however However, the teaching of Jesus is of such a profound order that it goes beyond what we have ever understood or think. The life of Jesus, his example, his messianic consciousness is beyond our comprehension. Um, how can a man have the conscience consciousness that Jesus the Messiah had he was absolutely confident that he was the chosen son of God he was the son of God um, why the four Gospels why give us that full detail and um, just three Gospels uh, would confirm each about the facts of Jesus's life why would he allow himself to be crucified or was he just crucified because he, he was upset in the political times and he was crucified and the disciples then turned that around I don't believe that I believe that he was truly the sacrifice for the world and for sin I really do and the resurrection They were really, they, they gave their lives for that belief. The details are too intricate to be made up. They gave their lives for it. It's consistent with the facts. And to me, if you look at all the messianic pretenders over the first five or six hundred years during and after Christ they're all crackpots they're all people mm -hmm. uh, either causing wars either they said the Messiah then they abandon being the Messiah mm -hmm. they're all real crackpots but Christ Christ was a man who well he just was focused it seems to me in dying on the cross for our sin and I think he stood out and he stands out not only in the first century but he stands out in the whole of history as being someone of infinite and amazing value and even today many millions of people see that that they trust Jesus because they believe that he truly was who he says he was he said I am the way the truth and the life no one can come to the Father but through me he is the way it's 
So in conclusion, I think that um, there was a variety of different views of Messiah, what a Messiah was, and I agree with the th Christian think tank. I think he's just demonstrated it very clearly. But what we've done is just explored questions from a skeptic's point of view. What would a skeptic say? We've tried to look at it from their point of view. Uh, but ultimately, I believe Christ stood out in history as the unique Son of God above all messianic pretenders. I don't think there was anyone like him in history. He was truly unique. And for that reason, I continue to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't forget to read the article Messianic Expectations in the First Century Judaism and may you enjoy that article it would be great fun. I'm going to go to bed now and I wish you all the best and love to everybody in your name Lord Jesus Christ Father we thank you for your love and grace and we pray that you would continue to bless bless this video may people begin to study about who you are Lord and come to know you in Jesus name Amen thank you for listening and God bless you I'm getting really tired now I'm going to go, I'm going to do some preaching in the morning. So God bless you and take care.